Wong Zai Tan, innovation, right? Mm, the, the, French, the Chinese do have a name for innovation. Yeah. <laughs> now, David, um, you were part of the original investment team, actually, in, in Tencent way back when. Uh, we wow. first met in 97, actually. Yeah. And uh, I hate to say, David was an intern for me. Um, well, I should have followed him, but anyway. It goes that's another beyond that. I used to... Um, I used to crash your couch. That's right. Still uh, available, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> That's a long story. But uh, for any students that are wondering how you ever get to China, um, you need to find someone with a couch. And even if they don't necessarily want you on the couch, you need to stay as long as you can <laughs> until you get a job. And that's exactly how I ultimately got to Tencent was through the graces of Duncan's couch. And I think Airbnb <laughs> has some clones in China. Yes. Also. Yeah, <laughs> we maybe had an idea that more way before it's time. But. There you go. <laughs> So you, I mean, you really joined, I mean, as we've heard uh, we, this morning, actually, people were talking about uh, Weixin. They were also talking about uh, yeah. Alipay. We're going to be ex you know, exploring some of how this came about. Um, but Tencent really is, is sort of, I mean, you joined when I think there were 24 people in the company. Um, yeah, about 45, yeah. Oh, 45, sorry. 45 and then is went to 24, like 15 here, so. Right. And now you're, <laughs> you're 24,000 in yeah. well, um, China as well. Now, you're here in Palo Alto. You're a few blocks away. Yeah, uh, so I'm based in Palo Alto. Uh, I've been part of the executive team for a long time. And uh, I guess, yeah, just to really briefly try to explain my role. Sure. Um, been part of the executive team from the beginning. And then I... I'm like the, since the very beginning, I was like the non-Chinese person in the Tencent executive team, so. The token Lao Wai. Yeah, right? the token <laughs> Lao Wai. And I'm, so I felt like um, I was always going to be the token Lao Wai, no matter what, no matter how good my Chinese was or whatever, no matter how friendly I was with China Mobile, shaking hands every day. Or, you married a Chinese woman, that's good. Uh, it was yeah. a starting point, yeah. <laughs> But so I figured, well, let me take advantage of the fact that I'm not Chinese and I'm probably never going to master it like a Chinese person. So I, instead of staying in Shenzhen, I, I very early on, 2001, I moved out here. And I, I just always have saw my role as trying to inject very unconventional ideas into our executive team, making people uncomfortable, trying to push us to do things that we may not have otherwise thought of doing. And if I feel like the, the company, like the ideas are getting stale, then I always try to make my self-heard. So there's, there's no actually good title for it. I'm just called Senior Executive Vice President. Um, I used to be called the International Guy, but I think... What's your title in Chinese, apart from Lao Wai? Some Gaoji Zhi Xing Fu Dong Cai, Right, so... Gaoji Zhi Xing Fu Dong Cai, Zong Ban, Zong Ban de Wang Dawei. Wang Dawei, or Wang a DW. Okay. okay, so that's me, thank you. Yeah. If it sounds amorphous, that's because it kind of is sometimes. So because you were in, really from the beginning, I mean, yeah. you know, 45 people is pretty much the beginning, um, you were able to kind of create this role and, and create yeah. this, as you said, you were you know, offering uh, challenges, I guess, to orthodoxy yeah. or, you know. Yeah. So you were kind of part of the furniture from the beginning of the company in a way. Yeah, right? that's right. Um, yeah. So that's different from a Chinese company that's sort of grown quite big. And yeah. then thinking about international, you've always had that international strain. Yeah, right? so uh, let me just explain yeah, that we'll thinking talk a bit more there, about if you don't mind. So uh, <clears throat> I think this is really where we're going, but it's taken so many years to get there. You know, something that you think will take three years sometimes um, takes 10. We've seen that with the internet. You know, people got very excited about the internet, the bubble in the late 90s, and then took a, a while to really come to fruition. So I think the same is kind of this, the case for Chinese internationalization and Tencent's internationalization. Things that I thought would take three years are taking more like 20 years, but they will happen. And when they happen, they happen in a very big way, just like we were kind of disappointed in 2000. The internet didn't happen the way everyone expected, but now our entire lives are really being structured by the internet. So these things do happen. To me, it was very simple. Tencent in the future and other Chinese companies like Alibaba and Alipay should be a little bit like the way we view Samsung or Sony or Nintendo and these great kind other Asian companies China. that have kind of really become accepted worldwide. Mm -hmm. I think when like my kids play a Nintendo Wii, they don't really think of it as a Japanese device and they don't really think of it as Nintendo. They think this is an American brand or it doesn't matter. And I'd love to see the point where Chinese companies get there where we're kind of just another great brand. And then maybe when people ask themselves, why? Why is this product so good? They're like, oh, because it's Chinese. Because the Chinese guys do this, they're really good. And that comes later, right? When you ask, why is Sony so great? It's like, oh, they're really good, you know? So For cooking, they're there, you know? Yeah. But, so. Right, yeah so. <laughs> anyway, so we're Chinese. So that's the dream. I, I think it, it, increasingly that seems like something that's happening now, um, but it takes time. But I mean, one of the, the challenges of emerging from China is that China is so vast and so big. Why bother, you know, even trying in, uh, you know, a place where you don't have a home court advantage, right? I mean, this has been definitely the case for some of the state-owned enterprises mm -hmm. like China Mobile, which has a small percentage of a company in Pakistan. Yeah. It's tiny. But yeah. in the internet, perhaps things are a bit different. Yeah. Well, so why even try? Um, boy, well, some things it's good for you like, because you know it's what? a job, like, right? Sometimes it's just vision. <laughs> it's like this is personally what I felt really strong about. 
as a, as a vision for me, you see, I thought it was very simple. Like China um, was closed off from the rest of the world pretty much, this is objectively speaking, till 1978. And then uh, it's been emerging onto the international scene uh, increasingly rapidly since 1978. And the only reason why you don't have all kinds of great successful Chinese uh, corporations around the world now is just because uh, they're kind of catching up late. You know, everyone's starting from 1978. It was a closed economy. And so for myself, uh, getting involved in China, it was very clear that it was just a matter of time before China was like everyone else with all these amazing companies around the world. It, it was kind of artificially cut off, and it's just taken more time. But a very important factor to add to that is the scale of this economy is no joke. I mean, we all know the, the numbers, 1.3 billion people. Um, if, if you can be successful in China, you're going to have very significant capital scale, very significant users, very significant experience. You know, like when we iterate in China, we're dealing with all kinds of demands across the country, with all kinds of users. And often the users don't have the kind of per capita income that they have here. So we have to be really thoughtful about how we do things. And plus, our model is really based on us charging our users for services as Tencent. This is something that's very unique for any internet company around the world. We do not make um, money from ads in the way that other internet companies do. We're about 10% ad-driven for the most part, and that's been the case for a long time. So 90% of our business is based on people actually being willing to pay us something. That's a very profound point. If we look, yeah. I mean, the valuation of Tencent today, I think, is north of 60 billion US dollars. Yeah, I try not to look. You so. don't look. Um, but that's significantly north of Facebook, which is struggling to find a, an advertising yeah, and model. Yeah, right? I don't so. think many people have really looked into our model. So I felt like, well, mm. we're building a lot of experience in this area with a lot of scale because we're in China and that leads to large capital scale. And I think at some point that's gonna be very useful for all kinds of users in all kinds of markets around the world. Um, we just have to really uh, focus on meeting the needs of the users around the world much more directly. Um, and that's kind of where we're going you now. You take it pretty seriously, like yeah. getting into the minds of users. You're saying you even like go into their homes with their permission, though. Uh, uh, yeah. How does that work? <laughs> yeah, I don't know of any cases without their permission. Well, yeah. well so uh, <laughs> if you were just trying to understand like how Tencent operates as a company, you know, we have to think about what could I say that would cut across every product and everything we do as a company. Uh, we, we have something that we call customer engagement. It's a kind of an operating methodology or a, almost a culture at Tencent. It, it's pretty simple at the end of the day. It, it, you know, every product manager knows that their, the way that they make decisions has to involve very deep customer feedback and very deep iteration with users. And the thing that makes us different than maybe typical Silicon Valley companies that are really into like data mining, business intelligence, A-B testing, that's all great stuff. We do that too. Um, but we really feel it's important that product managers engage directly in face-to-face -face interactions with their users. You have to like so no glass, shake the hand of the person things. you're serving. You okay. have to go, like if we're a restaurant, it's like you're working for McDonald's, you gotta go into your restaurant, you gotta watch people eating the burgers, you gotta eat your own food, you gotta see, are we really living up to our commitment here? Sometimes with internet companies, because of the way that we develop our services and we engineer them with computers and we disseminate them, a lot of companies kind of lose that touch with people and it's kind of dangerous over time because for us, uh, some of our services have hundreds of millions of users. Some of them are well over 500 million of users, 500 million users. And if we grow by one million users in a day, you're desensitized to it. It's like, oh, we grew by a million, but I was hoping for a million point five. Well, that's a million users. How do we actually scale things down sometimes to like the individual, really caring about the mom communicating with their kid, the kid who rides their bicycle 45 minutes to go to the internet cafe? How do we keep our eye on the, the big picture, but also like at the, mi the micro level? And we find that when we do that, there's a lot more um, personal satisfaction for people working at Tencent about what they do, because you can be really disappointed. I wanted to get a million users today, and instead I only got 800,000. I missed my targets. But, or you could just focus on the one person whose life you changed, right? And that's also very, that, that's really what it comes down to at the end of the day. So we try to make sure that people have a deep personal appreciation for what they're doing, and that's really the operating ethos of the company. The reason we're try, really trying to understand this sort of secret yeah. sauce of Tencent and innovation, and also at Alipay and Alibaba is, um, you know, just the numbers. I mean, let's take a step back. So you started very much, I guess, an instant messaging client was sort of the first public face of, of QQ, perhaps. Um, um, but you were able you know, to surf that wave and, and enter a market like games, for example, which has become, you're now dominating in China, which is one of the largest drivers of uh, revenue in the internet. Uh, and now with WeChat and other products into the mobile world. So there seems to be something that you're doing right. But uh, maybe you want to recap a little bit that, that trajectory um, and how, how that came about. Like all of our, well. Or just, just uh, yeah, some of the key so, points. Um, <clears throat> does anyone here use like a Tencent service? I'm wondering, like just, does anyone use WeChat? Thank you. That's really Who great. Who does not use it? Anyone <laughs> use WeChat? <laughs> 
，微信也没人用，微信，微信，大概可能百分之五十的人用微信是吧？那我们可可以都开那个 ，We can do this online. So about fifty percent, maybe 还在百分之五十人用。So, um, well, so a lot of people say, even in our executive team, there are some debates. Like sometimes it seems like we're doing everything, and it's kind of true. I mean, we're doing almost everything on the internet. Um, and how does we, we and you don't buy work? companies, right? You tend to do well, it all. Well, we tend do, to build internally. We, we do investments. We right. bought some. But usually, like our Exception. executive team's way of thinking, how am I going to expand, is usually by putting engineers behind the problem, right. usually. And that's very different than other executive teams that might feel like you know they're just going to spend money, too. But that's not how we've uh, Which makes things. you, I mean, to some extent, so, it makes you unpopular, because startups in China want to get bought by Tencent, but it's yeah. not going to happen, mostly. Uh, I think, <laughs> yeah, I don't work on that part of the business, but they should, by all means, uh, you know, approach whoever they okay. need to approach to do that. <laughs> but I, I don't think there's anything we're opposed to, necessarily. But right. the most important part of any deal or any service is we, we really strive for platform integration. So um, we, we started with instant messaging. As you mentioned, uh, maybe there's a couple of QQ users in the audience here. But you know, we start with QQ. And then um, we, we noticed that we had a very deep relationship with the user. On average, users were in QQ for about four hours a day. And we started thinking, that's a lot. How can we, yeah, <laughs> how can we give them more? Um, it wasn't really about competing with other people. Right. In fact, Tencent very rarely thinks about competing with others, although the media likes to see a good fight. But for us, it's like, we're just thinking, how do we add more user value? And then sometimes when we expand, it upsets people. Uh, and I, we get it. I mean, that's fine. But, um, but basically, we started with instant messaging, and we, we kept thinking about how do we add more value to users. You mentioned the entrance into games. Entering into games is very simple for us. We, were, um, we used to be the most favorite thing for people to do in internet cafes until about 2002. And then we noticed that people would go in and send instant messaging messages to their friends. And then they go play games for like four hours. And then they would leave. They would send a few messages to their friends, and they were out. So we got like 10 minutes of time, and the games got like four hours of time or three hours of time. So we felt like this was actually potentially very disruptive to our business because we weren't providing a lot of value compared to the game companies. So we started thinking, what can we do to get users into games? And we approached games very much from the perspective of games being an interactive platform. We weren't very interested in art or design or this kind of stuff, or single player games. We were all concerned about multiplayer games, giving yeah. the QQ users who are always communicating with each other something more to do, more interactive context to interact with each other. And then that's just grown to where it is today, where it's a very big business. I think every additional service like games that we have done have always been informed by just a very pretty straightforward decision, thinking about how we can add more value to our users. And, um, and can, we, can we integrate that service with other parts of our platform to provide a really valuable offering? And, and why, yeah. while you don't uh, buy companies very often, although yeah. you do, um, you do invest, um, yeah. and you have a philosophy, again, getting behind the founding team is really Yeah, that's really important for us. I think, uh, so there's been a lot of questions that I get, you know, sometimes from friends or people in the industry, like, what are we going to do next, and is Tencent going to buy some big company or something? Cause we and you're have, how many people here in Palo Alto? You're, uh, Palo Alto is about 50 right now. You have now. Boston? And we have a small team in Boston, yeah, we have... Um, we have some other, you know, number of companies we've invested in. Some of that's R&D and some of that's investment, or is it? Yeah, okay. yeah. So, I mean, I think that probably the most notable um, investment we've done in the U.S. is with a company called Riot Games, which operates extremely independently, kind of to your point about us um, leaving operations to run independently. But the, the, the ultimate philosophy is we look for great founders that we can get behind as a company. <laughs> so uh, we feel like we're most effective when we find a really powerful, smart, entrepreneuring, you know, founding team with a great vision that we're also excited about, and we get behind them to support. And when that founding team uh, doesn't need us to be involved, uh, they're running their show. We're not, like, trying to interfere in their daily operations and that kind of stuff. But when they ask us for support, we try to be very aggressive. And is China always them. part of the equation? or um... Often not. No, like, so when we do investments in the U.S., China is often not necessarily the most important thing at all. Yeah, we're, I mean, now as a company, we're just trying to expand um, internationally. So... Uh, and this model works really well. Like we, we work with founders that are focused on the U.S. market. We get behind them, and that's how we feel like we have a greater opportunity for success is by letting that founder team, you know, go after the local market and us supporting them. And you've also made yeah. investments in more mature companies, like in, in, in Russia, DST Mill, who, yeah. who have backed Facebook and Zynga and other companies yeah. like that. So it's early stage as well. Yeah, I think at well the end of the day, like like say a company um, is going after a certain part of the market, and we get behind them with an investment or maybe even you know, like a majority investment. 
we want to make sure they share our sensitivity to users. Remember I was talking about with that whole customer engagement stuff? Like, right. do they listen to users? Are they really sensitive to users? Do they have similar, maybe different, but, but similar operating processes that share our, our care about the users? Like, that's really important to us because then we know, like, when they face a difficult decision um, or they're developing their products, that they're doing it in a way that we're very comfortable mm -hmm. with. And they kind of share our DNA, even though they're reflection of that DNA, the way they do it may be different than us. But I think that's, that's a really important part of getting behind any operating team. That's how we actually allow them to be very independent, because we know they're going to do things um, in the right way. You said earlier that you, you know, you've acted always to sort of challenge the orthodox thinking and things like that. How do you sort of disseminate that through the company? Do you bring people Well, from I don't know if anyone else would agree with that at 10 said. Maybe they would say I'm not very effective. But um, no. I, yeah, there's no easy way. Probably. Um, Do you cycle people from Shenzhen through here? And, and yeah. 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 So, so we, we have uh, not not nothing formally, but people visit here all the time. Okay. Um, usually it's when I go back and I do like some internal talks with our staff, or certainly in our executive meetings, um, people will expect something kind of outrageous from me. Sometimes, right. like that's kind of my role is to make some outrageous claims like... Are we seeing more outrageous know. people, uh, hopefully, uh, coming uh, through the Chinese education system as well? I mean, you talked earlier that you have this ability wow. to, to get a lot of engineers on certain products, but in terms That's of... That's such a sensitive issue to talk about the Chinese... I actually, well, I, I mentioned changing, the Chinese right? education system at one of our internal meetings recently, and this was the part of the talk that really got everyone so excited because I think there is a sense in China that people would really like to see more innovation in the education system um, because I think it's... I, I was educated in China, but I, I, I spent a little time in Asia. Your Chinese is pretty good. We'll show that later. Yeah, but you know, <laughs> the, there's a sense that's very top down, yes. and that um, the top down approach is not conducive to a lot of like open lateral up, you know, t kind of bottom up thinking. But isn't internet changing that? Because even though the formal class is the same, all the kids are on QQ, right? So, and they're doing stuff. I think the education system is remarkably resilient to that. Okay. <laughs> I, because I think phones, it's very right? top, yeah. like, uh, but <laughs> the interesting thing is that the kids that are getting the top-down education, uh, we're probably annoying some people by talking about this Good, now, that's what we're we're, we didn't yeah. go through it ourselves, but <laughs> I'm sensitive to that, but, um, but you know, they, uh, they go home, and if they're, you know, if they have access to the internet, then they're getting all kinds of information from other sources, so I think you are getting, you know, a blended model, but I just think this is a great challenge for China overall, because I think, you know, China's next big challenge is to come up with the next iPad, the next SpaceX rocket that Not commercializes just make it, but space. Not just design it, right? Yeah, yeah I mean, to yeah. actually be mm. the Apple of the right. future. Like, I'd love to see, you know, Tencent evolve into that kind of position or maybe, you know, a peer company like Alibaba. I think that's where we need to go is to truly do, um, how, what do we call them, products or services that blow people's minds that maybe hadn't been seen in any similar form around the world, and people would love these services. And I think that's how, it's great for China, it's great for the world. I think that's how China really gets to the next step of development, but how do you get there? How do you get another Steve Jobs? How do you get someone with that kind of vision? And I think you need to give them the space to do kind of crazy things somehow. And I don't feel like the education system, honestly, gives, typically gives people that kind of space. I, I have a music program of mine in, um, in Sichuan province, province in the Jaichu, just in the the Jaichu, the earthquake zone. It's kind of a philanthropy project of mine. I wanted to teach people rock and roll music. And I mean, it's going now, but there's been a lot of challenges just to give the kids a chance to play music. You know, give them an hour a day or an hour on the weekend to play guitar. I bought like, I don't know, like 50 or 100 electric guitars and like all these drums and basses. And Probably on Taobao, but we'll get to that. And I, I'm <laughs> yeah, you I, bought them on Taobao, sorry. <laughs> But anyways, like, it seemed like there's a real issue there with the teachers giving the kids enough time. I think they get some time, but it's like, yeah. it's kind of like, often they're not really given any time the to play. Gaokao system. And I'm trying to dig in, like, what's going on here? It's like, oh, it's Gaokao. It's, you yeah. know, the high school exams. Gaokao is high this, school like, exam. horrendous exam. It's actually exam. a junior high school, so it's right. not Gaokao. Even before worse, that. Before that. I thought yeah. I was doing the right thing by working yeah. with the junior high school in the Jai Chu. They still, I yeah. mean, and all I want these kids to do is just, like, experience the love of music, you know, rock out, have a good time. That's what I did when I was their age. And it seems like it's a real challenge because it kind of conflicts with the top-down priorities of the government. And I'm like, you know, I think you need a little bit of both. I think you need a lot of, you know, stringent, high, highly disciplined education. But at the same time, give the kids a chance to make their own music. I just want them to make their own music, not like study someone else's music. You know, come up with their own songs. And I think when China gets that balance right, it's going to be super powerful because, you know, the mathematics and all, like, the science capabilities of the country are absolutely incredible. I think like Shanghai has like the number one school in the world now or something like that. 
but you combine that with like creativity. That's, that's also a, very innate to China. Steve Jobs, uh, technology, and you know, I mean, it's going to be amazing. Yeah. So, right. so we're getting close. Looking forward it to. Sounds like that's what I'm looking for. And these are the kind of things I'll share inside Tencent that make me kind of crazy. So you're getting a taste of it. Great. No. Okay. <laughs> Next time you got to bring your electric guitar. Then. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we'll hold your questions, and hopefully we're going to get careful some ideas. Be what you from ask this. for. Yeah. No. <laughs>